There may not be a singular book of Joseph, but the largest narrative of Genesis covers Joseph in the book. This tells us that such an account carries great significance and as such is worth a special observance. Within Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we will discover the patterns of God's work through his providence and his promises for his people, all of which are interwoven through human fallenness, failures, and betrayal. Which means this, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the picture and power of the gospel. Throughout the account, Joseph may be the central figure, but his family, especially Judah, draws a prophetic line to the coming Messiah. You see, through Joseph in the book, God is reversing the curse and revealing the blessing. And that is why in Joseph's life, we see a type of Christ, betrayed by his own family, only to one day be in the very position to save many. So as we trace the life of Joseph from a low pit to the high palace, let us learn the lessons and know the blessings of steady obedience to God's promises regardless of our circumstances. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. I don't want to spend too much time doing a recap, but I think it's important to understand where we've been. Genesis chapter 37, it took us a while to get there, if you recall, and the reason why is I wanted to spend some time on what I'm calling the runway of Genesis, right? And on that runway, we looked at the two larger narratives that make up the book of Genesis. Genesis being a prologue to the Torah. Genesis tethered to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in the book of Genesis, the two larger narratives included chapters 1 to 11, which shows us God's relationship to the world. That's you and I. And we looked at how God formed man in his image. So you have the form of man. And then you have, as quickly as God formed man, the fall of man. Sin entering in, marring the image of God in man. The explosion of sin throughout the world and violence, which led to the flood. So from the form to the fall to the flood. And it wasn't long after the flood where the earth was repopulated through Noah and his family that once again, you discover, for man so hates the Lord. Because we are sinners, we are in opposition against God. We so hate the Lord, whether we admit it or not, our sin nature is at war against God. And man so hates the Lord, he's a slave to his only begotten sin. That is the best thing you can produce as a sinner. Slavery to sin. And yet God did not leave us in that condition. No, because that narrative in Genesis is the foundation and beginning, remember, of a greater narrative for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So in that one narrative, you see the fall of man, you see the marring of God's image, and yet God sending his son at the perfect time in human history to redeem the image that was fallen and to reorient man's image around himself. That's recreation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The image of God is recreated. The second larger narrative ran chapters 12 to chapter 50, God's relationship to Israel. Kind of this is where we're at in order to understand the family of Jacob and Joseph. Well, it started with a man named Abram. God changed his name to Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac was the promised son. Ishmael and the Ishmaelites produce a people who are at war against God's people. And then Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau, firstborn, Jacob, secondborn. Jacob is the chosen son. Jacob's name is chosen to be Israel, governed by God. A people would come through Jacob 
through his sons, 12 of them, that would eventually become known as Israel, the Israelites. But then we stop and we look at Joseph. Why Joseph? Joseph parallels and points to Jesus. Like a watermark. Remember the watermark image beneath the sheet of paper can barely see unless sometimes light shines upon the paper. And in the backdrop, in the background is that watermark image. Well, Jesus, like a watermark, his image is imprinted or embedded in these pages of Joseph. And it's remarkable. And we're going to make our case for that. David would write a psalm, Psalm 105. I want to read verses 16 to 19 just to show you how the history of Joseph was so important, like a hinge, like a chain link in the promises of God for the people of God. David would write, moreover, he called for a famine in the land, speaking of God. He destroyed all the provision of bread. Think about what I just said there. God called for a famine in the land, which we'll get to. God destroyed all the provision of bread. He's setting the stage so that his choice of deliverance would come through his person. Who's that person? Verse 17. He sent a man, God, before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. So God sends Joseph as a 17-year-old boy to be sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. God's choice. Led away as a slave? Wrists, ankles, and chains? Verse 19. Until the time that his word came to pass. Okay, until the time of Joseph's word, Joseph's dreams, remember them. Joseph's revelatory dreams shared publicly until the time that Joseph's dreams would be fulfilled. What was God doing? Ready for it? The word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord was testing or refining Joseph as a 17-year-old boy. The word of the Lord would take him through sufferings. We say from the pit to the prison to the palace, and it comes off my tongue smoothly, but it didn't happen that easily. And we often err greatly when we read such accounts and we jump from chapter to chapter and we don't stop and consider as a 17-year-old boy, he is betrayed by his very family. We know the story of Joseph. How quickly do we place him in the pit without even thinking about the humanity of it? Sold as a slave, falsely accused of rape. Oh, but I know the end. He's eventually taken out of that place and put into a position of prominence. Yeah, but not without the word of the Lord testing him. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you've been through, but I know the word of the Lord is testing you while you go through, refining you, and preparing you. Now, here's the point. He's preparing you for what? He's preparing you for what he's prepared for you. God prepares us as we go through these things in life. God prepares us for what he has prepared for us. Well, what does he prepare for us? This isn't prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about wealth, health, and happiness. I'm talking about the very situations that you can't see that are coming in your life, but now's the time to open up your heart and mind to be prepared so that when you get there, you're mature enough to handle the responsibilities of what it looks like. This is what faith means. Having a faith in a God who is faithful, how he prepares us for what he has prepared for us and what he has prepared for us is to serve his purpose. Don't get it twisted for a second. What he has prepared you for and what he is preparing for you to walk into, the good works, always serve his purpose. Yes, even suffering, as we will see with Joseph. Are you guys comfortable yet? Everybody's comfortable? All right, good. I'm gonna ask you to stand up as I read the word of God.
Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 11. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with one of the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age. And he also made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream. He told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I, your brothers indeed come down to bow down to you before the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. This is the word of the Lord. Father, take us deeper in your word, O God. Refine us according to your word, O God. Amen. You may have your seats. Genesis chapter 37, verse 12 and 13 begins where we just left off. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. And I stopped there because I was interested in those three words. Again, as a Bible student, they jumped off the page. Here I am. This was a ready response of a son who is diligent and obedient to a father. The assignment where his brothers were off in the fields of Shechem, and we'll get into what that means in a little bit. This is about 40 to 60 miles from home. The father's gonna send Joseph. As we just read about, he's like a foreman to his brothers. He is more or less shepherding them as they're shepherding the flock. Joseph, 17 years of age, is in charge of his brothers. Jacob's gonna send him off to check up on them, and Joseph asks no questions. Here I am. Again, I stopped and said, is this the posture of my heart when God speaks? When my Father in heaven speaks to me and commands me and instructs me, do I say, here I am? Is this the ready posture of the Christian in response to the voice of our God in the day and age that we live in to just simply say with no questions asked, here I am. So I wanted to look up who else said, here I am. And there were six other individuals, including Joseph, seven. And you know, I love biblical numerology. And I said, seven, seven figures. God's number seven, who also, when God spoke, they didn't ask questions. They said, here I am. The first was Abraham, Joseph's grandfather. Abraham said, here I am to God in Genesis chapter 22, verse one. And this is when God asked Abraham to take his son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. So God speaks to Abraham and he says, here I am. The next time we read about these three words, it's from Jacob, Joseph's father in Genesis 31, verse 11. And guess how God spoke to Jacob in that chapter, in a dream. Now are you wondering why Jacob kept in his heart that his son had a dream that was probably from God? He's now beginning to see, wait a second, this isn't something uncommon in my family. And in Genesis 31, verse 11, Jacob 2, in response to God speaking to him to go, 
He says, here I am. Moses, the deliverer. That is connected to Joseph's story. Wait a second. All these years later, God would speak to a man named Moses from a burning bush in Exodus chapter three, verse four, as he goes back to investigate this bush that is not being consumed, yet it's on fire, and God speaks to him, Moses, Moses, and guess what he says? Here I am. Here I am. And we're not done. First Samuel chapter three, verse four, we're introduced to the prophet Samuel as a boy. And he's staying with Eli. And it's at night and he hears the voice he thinks is Eli's voice. So he reports to the bedside and says, here I am. And Eli says, I haven't called you. He goes back. It happens three times. He gets out of bed. He runs to Eli. Here I am. Eli begins to think, I think God is speaking. He says to the young boy, next time God speaks, you say, speak, your servant is listening. And I'm like, wow, here I am. And the next thing I should be saying to my father in heaven is speak, your servant is listening. Okay, what do you want me to do? The next time we read about the three words, here I am, it's from the prophet Isaiah, when he's commissioned and called into ministry. In chapter six, verse eight, he sees the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. He recognizes that he has a tongue or lips that are unclean. He is dwelling amongst the people whose tongues and lips are uncleaned. This angel flies and, and touches his tongue to cleanse his tongue because he's about to be commissioned to speak. So he has to say something to let God know he's ready for the voice of God. He says, here I am, send me. And just in this sermonette, from Joseph's three words, here I am, you discover these other six figures, six figures, <laughs> who also had a posture to say, here I am, speak, your servant is listening, here I am, send me. And then I stopped and I said, I can't get out of this one phrase. And I recognized, and I believe there's a lesson to learn in the here I am's that points us to the great I am. What do you mean? Now, Jesus may not have said, here I am to his father, but his entire ministry on earth, he made statements like, I'm only doing what the father commanded me to do. I'm only speaking what the father has already said. I'm only mirror mirroring exactly what it is that's happening in heaven with my father. In essence, he's saying, here I am to do his will. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verses five to seven, I believe the here I am is given some commentary by Jesus himself. Therefore, when he came into the world, this is speaking of Jesus, look at it on the screen. When he came into the world, translation in Greek, when he was coming into the world, as he was coming into the world, as he is coming into the world, when he's coming into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Here you have the writer of Hebrews quoting Psalm chapter 40, a prophetic messianic Psalm speaking about Jesus, listen to me, Jesus the Son's conversation with the Father in heaven. And as they look, and this is me adding commentary, I'm just conjecturing here, but I'm thinking it through. As they look down upon a godless world, a world that had rejected God's word, God's prophets, he said, Jesus to his dad, here I am, send me, prepare me a body. On this first Advent Sunday, a season where we celebrate the first coming of our King, do we even understand or give thought to what it means that God was with us, that he came, that Jesus said, prepare me a body because it was a body that would eventually become the sacrifice 
It wasn't in the sacrificial system, the priest doing sacrificial things in the temple. No, Jesus himself was coming to be that sacrifice. Think with me, if you will. In the incarnation, it's what we call it, the embodiment of God, the word becoming flesh. In the incarnation, God chose a crucifixion instead of a coronation. Now, I don't know about you, but you would think that if the king of kings was being sent to earth, his creation, that the red carpet would have been laid out before him and a coronation would have ensued and we would have crowned him king. And yet the opposite is what God chose before the coronation, which is the second coming. Our God chose a crucifixion and this brutal form of execution was part of God's plans. Jesus said, here I am, send me. And he came and laid down his life. Now here's the difference. Joseph has no idea where he's being sent. Joseph has no idea what's waiting for him when he gets there. Your God knew exactly why he was coming and what he was sent into. And the very violent hands of his own brothers would place him on a tree. We think about it in December of every year, but I'm saying this is the foundation of every Christian, that God became a man and that man became a lamb and that lamb's death served to bring man life. Verse 14, back to our context. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. All right, now why is Jacob concerned about his sons? Well, obviously it's his family business. His son Joseph more or less is going to report back to him like a good steward would about the inventory of his brothers and the flocks. But you gotta also understand the specific location has probably been of great concern to Jacob because of things that have occurred only a few years earlier. And if you read through Genesis chapter 33, you discover this area, Shechem, was a parcel of land that Jacob purchased. Not uncommon for a shepherd because the moment their surrounding fields would no longer be grazable, they would purchase other lands, sometimes 40 to 60 miles away from home so that you could shepherd your flock in other places and other lands so that by the time you're done with those lands, you can swing back to your homeland so that the crop or the grass can be replenished. This was a system, but you also will read about Shechem in Genesis 34. Oh, it's a heavy chapter. It's a grievous chapter. With Jacob and his family in that immediate area, Shechem, which by the way was named after the prince of the area. His name was Shechem. In Genesis 34, you read of the sole daughter of Jacob. Her name's Dina. Dina goes out into the community to meet the other daughters of Shechem. And Shechem himself sees her and has an infatuation, a lust. The Bible actually says he loved her, but it was not a love that would tend to or care for someone that they were pursuing. No, he actually takes her by force and rapes her. So Dina is raped, defiled, the Bible says. Jacob finds out and holds his peace. Now, I don't know how he's holding his peace after hearing about a bad situation like that in a land where he's at and he holds his peace and you, you can't really read too much into the text other than to say, Jacob is a dysfunctional father, probably doesn't know how to handle these types of situations, but the brothers find out. Shechem thinks it's normal, approaches Jacob with his father and asks for his daughter Dina to be wed to him. Think about this. Just took something by force and now is asking to have her hand in marriage. 
Well, the brothers find out about what happened. So they go to this meeting and they say, we can't give you our sister unless you choose to get circumcised. These guys, they were planning something. Now, this is going to give you a picture of what was in their hearts, but I'm not trying to justify what is about to occur, but I'm simply saying there's something there where their sister was defiled and raped, and they are going to act revenge. Shechem wants Dina so bad, they convince all the men in the community to get circumcised. Now, while they're in bed, pain-stricken from the procedure, Levi and Simeon, Dina's brothers, come with sword. And the Bible says in Genesis 34, slaughters every male in Shechem. Kills them all. Takes all their possessions, plunders all their homes. Listen to me. Genesis 34, takes their wives and their children. Did you ever even know that occurred? Now Jacob says to his sons, how could you do this? You've brought shame upon my name to the neighboring community. And they say to their father, translation mine, are you kidding me? They did that to your daughter, our sister, and you're worried about your name? This is terrible. Could it be why Jacob is concerned about his boys in Shechem? They're back in Shechem. Are there family members that are still alive that are gonna try to act revenge on them? I don't know. I do know as a parent myself with two little ones, I can only imagine the concern and care that my parents had about me and my brothers when we would go to certain places and certain locations where something may have occurred years ago, whether it was a fight or something stupid for just being boys. And we're like, we're going back there. I can only imagine their hearts just dropping going, you're going back there? Chapter 35 of Genesis is where God still calls Jacob. Why? Because God's calling and faithfulness is unto himself. No matter how jacked up or messed up one may be, no matter how dysfunctional this family is, and they are, God is still faithful to his covenant. Remember that from last Sunday? Thank Jesus that his faithfulness is not contractual because we did everything to break that contract. It's covenantal. So Joseph goes, here I am. He sent to Shechem to check up on his brothers as his father commanded, verse 15. Now a certain man found him. This may have been several days later because 40 to 60 miles on foot may have taken several days. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in a field. This is Joseph. And the man asked him, no name to the man, just the mysterious man in these few verses. What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here for I heard them say, this man is in close proximity to the brothers in the field. He overhears them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now, these verses, you could do without them. In the grand scheme of the narrative, <laughs> think about this. Jacob says, Joseph, go. We could just read about Joseph stumbling upon his brothers without this inclusion of a certain man. Joseph would have known the exact field to go to in Shechem. He shows up, nobody's there, but there's a guy there. If the guy's not there, I'm wondering, does Joseph give up his journey? Does he return home and then there's no thrusting into the pit? And yet I believe the Bible is sharing with us and showing us that, oh, this is by God's providence. You might not like what's about to happen with the brothers in the pit, but a certain man is pointing him in that direction. And the certain man reroutes him. And you as a Bible-believing Christian need to stop and consider in your own life the happenstances, the chances, the coincidences, the things that you don't even remember, the certain people that you remember their face, but you can't remember their name, but they pointed you in a certain direction and you needed to land or be exactly where God wanted you to be. And it may have even placed you in a pit, proverbially. And you may have stopped and said, if I had not listened to that person, if I have not, did not consider that advisement, I wouldn't be 
If that had not happened to me there, I would not be here. Newsflash, Christian. God is gonna lead you where he needs you. Wait, 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 what? God is gonna lead me where he needs me? Oh, yes. And the beauty about that statement and where he leads you, you don't have to be able to see through. You don't have to see on the other side of where he leads you. You can be in the midst of that fog. You can be in the midst of those clouds and you can't see what God is up to, but you don't have to. You just have to look above to heaven and say, God is faithful. Because even when you can't see through what it is you're going through, God is still faithful to his word. You need to know this, church, because I don't know where, where, we're, where we're headed. I don't know what lies ahead in this world. But I know the one who is leading us where he needs us. And I know the one that even though I can't see through what I'm going through, he is still faithful. Because stop for a second. Put this together. A certain man tells Joseph, hey, your brothers aren't here anymore. And I was in close proximity and overheard their conversation and even where they're headed. And he points them to the next location, by the way, is about 10 to 15 miles from here. So Joseph is relentlessly pursuing his brothers because he's on mission from his father. Here I am, send me. He has no clue that what's about to happen, he's gonna have this dream early on that's gonna become a nightmare and he can't see it and he can't see through what he's about to go through. But here's the point that even the violent hands of his brothers are under the complete control of the sovereign hands of the father. Are you understanding what I'm saying this morning? Joseph had a destiny in a pit. I know we like to skip those chapters and get to the palace. I know it because it's our human nature, right? And yet God's like, no, I'm gonna take you through some stuff so that my word can refine you and mature you. Verse 18 to 20. Now, when they saw him afar off, again, likely there are paths that were chosen for travel in the middle of a valley or a field, they would have likely saw him from a great distance. Why else could they identify their brother? His robe, his coat of many colors, his tunic. Now, there are plenty of interpretations or explanations of the coat. I don't wanna get lost in the details. Just remember the coat signified the father's favor, likely signified the son would inherit the father's estate. And he's one of the youngest. So it's a slap in the face of the oldest. His name's Reuben. And the coat could have been many colors, as the Bible says, or it could have been a decorative coat. Some have even suggested, and I thought it was a fascinating suggestion, that the coat or tunic was pure white. Pure white. And when he was walking in any setting, it reflected any colors that bounced off it. It was that pure white. And I said, that's a pretty cool thought. Either or, the brothers see him coming. Watch what they do. They conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. And in these statements, which we have access to on paper, are literally the thoughts of a wicked heart. Now, I want you to think through this with me. As short of a period of time from them spotting Joseph, conspiring their conspirers, conspiring also had with it the cover-up. Think about this. Think about the premeditated behavior of the brothers. They see their brother. They're not just jealous of him. They're not just angry with him. They're not just hostile toward him. They're now conspiring. And their plan includes the terrain. Let's kill him. Let's throw him into a pit. By the way, the pits were watering holes. Some had water for the grazing of animals. Some are empty, as we'll find out. Let's throw him into the pit and let's tell our father, in essence, he was killed by a wild beast. They're already 
covering up the premeditated act that they had not executed yet. This is the sinful heart of man. They hate Joseph. How deep is their hate? Their hate is so deep. Its ground is hell. We don't often talk about hate being grounded in hell because if the love of God is grounded in heaven, then the hate, what type of hate? Well, let's use the Bible to explain the Bible. First John chapter three, verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. The case study in that chapter, John would write about Cain killing Abel. Cain, he says, incited by the wicked one, Cain of the wicked one, incited by the devil, this type of hate, kills his brother. And then he answers a question that you might ask, that I've asked, why did he kill his brother? The Bible says, because Cain's works were unrighteous or wicked and Abel's works of righteousness. Wait, what? Think about Joseph diligently reporting to his father about the works of his brother, being willing to bring a bad report, which wasn't popular, which was one of the reasons why the brothers hated him. His father loves him more than the other brothers because it's the son of his old age. He gives him a gift. It's a tunic of decoration. This makes the brothers hate him even more. Now let's compound this already boiling hostility and envy with Joseph having dreams. And Joseph tells the dreams, but guess what? The main actors in the dream are the brothers bowing to him. Oh, they hated him. And now the opportunity has presented itself to eliminate him. Now stop, because we know what's about to happen. And I think the goal of this series is to constantly orient your heart around what God is up to. Because in life, each snapshot of life doesn't come with the commentary that this is what God's doing but you gotta have a faith that knows God's doing something because here's what's happening. The brothers are plotting and the plot involves them slaying their own brother. And we know the alternative plan, which we're about to read about, isn't them slaying him, it's them selling him as a slave. And while they're slaying him seemingly and then selling him as a slave, God's going, oh, you have no idea. I'm behind all of this because I am gonna use Joseph to save. Do you understand all of these pieces needed to get Joseph in a certain position so he would end up at a certain destination so he can be in a certain occupation so that God could use him to save his own people and the world. It's a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. But notice what they say. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's see if his dreams are fulfilled after we kill him. Now, a lot of people have taken Joseph's dreams and they've written into sermons and commentaries and series about your dreams. But this isn't Joseph's dreams. This is a dream God gave him, right? You're gonna fulfill your dreams, Christian. Oh, no, you're not. No, you won't. Nope, don't matter how big those dreams are. Doesn't matter how many resources you have towards that dream. If it's not of God, you will not accomplish it. So this is God's will, God's dream, God's vision, God's revelation to Joseph. And the brothers, a picture of the world, are trying to kill what God has said. Oh, now you're saying, no matter what God has said, the enemy is trying to slay and the enemy is trying to kill. But the, the, the devil will never be able to stop what God has said. The word of God is the proof that the enemy will never be able to stop what God has said. In fact, there have been great people of great authority and great power through the ages who have tried to stop what God has said. So much so that they've gathered to themselves all the powers and all the systems of the world as an attempt to oppose what God has said. They've used all their intellectual, all their philosophical, all their political, and all their physical forces they could possibly command to destroy God's word. We know it. Emperors have tried to burn this book. Emperors have even banned this book. Scholars have tried to discredit this book. Critics have tried to bury this book. Progressives try to change this book. The world tries to ignore this book. And yet while human governments have fallen and they have have, and human philosophies have failed and they will. God's word never stops flourishing. Nothing can stop God's word once he speaks it. Amen. 
the world at its best will only be able to slander God's word, right? That's why you're seeing an attempt to redefine marriage. It's the world's attempt to slander God's word. But it doesn't matter what they try to do. They'll never be able to slay God's word. Isaiah 55 Verses 10 and 11, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but they water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The rain and the snow as an illustration coming down from heaven and accomplishing something in the world. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. This is Joseph's dream. God's word from heaven is about to take birth, but it's gotta go through some contractions first. It's gotta go through some suffering first. Verse 21, but Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Okay, insertion of Reuben. What we're gonna see is the evolution of Reuben. There are other figures in this story that are gonna to come to the surface, one being Judah, the other Reuben. You're gonna see that God is doing a work even in his brothers. So from this point, Reuben, the eldest, responsible for his brothers to his father, longing for his father's favor and attention, no doubt. Reuben overlooked Joseph, the chosen son, the favored son, wearing the robe that Reuben should be wearing. Yet Reuben here has the wherewithal to say, let's not kill him. It don't make a difference what his intentions were. He wanted to save Joseph and he uses the same part of the plan about the pit as a interlude before he can come back and spare him. It makes no difference how he does it or why he's doing it. What you gotta know is that God is the one who's doing it. And I've said to this assembly before, please hear my heart. Man is immortal until God's purpose in that man's life is final. Nothing can take you out until your time, your purpose that God has given you will be accomplished. I'm still here. (laughs) Pastor Gene just said at 85 years of age, I'm still here. That's right, brother. Man is immortal until God's purpose for his life is final. Reuben is going to be used to eventually cause him to be in the pit for whatever reason, and we'll see the evolution of Reuben. Verse 23, now it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic. There it is, the tunic of many colors that was on him. That was the point of their contention and envy. Then they took him and cast him into the pit and the pit was empty. Thank you, the pit was empty. If the pit was filled with water, there was no water in it. It could have been one of the means of drowning him, but there's no water in the pit. God's providence, even in these details. And they sat down to eat a meal. This is where in the account of Joseph, his dreams, become a nightmare. Because remember in his dreams, his brothers are bowing to him. I don't think he's thinking about his dreams as they're grabbing him and tearing his tunic off him and wrestling him to the ground. And eventually, remember, there's 10 of them. And the 10 are likely grabbing him by his limbs and then throwing him into a pit that could have been 10 feet deep. Again, there's no emotions to these verses. We just go to the next verse to get to the next chapter, to get to the end of the book. And we're like, okay, we're in the palace. And God's like, I'm trying to get you to navigate the pit and the betrayal and the hurt and the pain. And I'm using it all. But I couldn't stop reading the one final line in verse 25a. They just assault their brother. The original plot was to kill him. The alternative plan was to cast him into the pit and wait until they could figure something out. But notice how they just nonchalantly sit down and eat a meal. They they sit down to eat a meal. What just occurred here is that sin, as we're breaking it down, has so consumed them that they could do their absolute worst and feel no remorse. Oh, it doesn't start off that way. There are stages to sin. Begins at a point and a place and a time 
the recognition that I'm a sinner and I'm in desperate need of a savior and a Holy Spirit governor. But if that sin is not choked out or paralyzed by the power of the cross, I'll tell you what will happen. The Bible actually tells us in James chapter one, verses 14 and 15, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Sin unchecked progresses to death, always. So I don't know what the brothers were experiencing, likely a trauma from their upbringing, the dysfunction of a father from chapters 34 and the rape of their sister to the constant moving, having four moms in essence, Jacob has four wives. And I don't know how he did it because I'm having trouble with one wife. That was just a joke. My father-in-law is here. <laughs> oh. Okay. Genesis chapter 42 tells us in one verse that they ignored, they ignored the first convictions of sin. Watch this. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. They heard him yell, they heard him plead, they heard him cry out for help, don't do this, I'm your brother. They heard it and yet the voices of Joseph stopped at their ears and never made it to their heart. Right, because the stages of sin and these guys show us it goes from a grief experience and insecurity. The insecurity likely rolled over to an envy. Remember, they, they want what Joseph has. The envy not checked rolls over to hostility. Now it's boiling and it's gonna bubble over. Hostility to conspiracy. They see him coming, the opportunity is presenting itself. Let's have a plan, let's get rid of him. The conspiracy rolls over to felony. Felony and an act of violence. Perfect situation to deal with him. Now here's where we go, what happens next after the felony is committed? Well, envy, hostility, conspiracy, felony, guess what they roll over to? Sociopathy, sociopathic tendencies, psychopathy, psychopathic tendencies. You're just going, wait a second. You only apply sociopathy and psychopathy behavioral disorders to psychopaths and people that have killed a lot of people and they've done manic stuff in the community. I'm going, no, 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 no. You gotta understand something. This is the nature of sin, the progression therein. And 30% of the population actually displays these types of tendencies. Oh yes, 30%. That's about one out of three. One out of three people have psychopathic or sociopathic tendencies. That's one, two, psychopath. One, two, psychopath. Like, let's, let's be real here. But, but what we're talking about, you ready for this? What we're talking about, is it just a numbing from sin? They're sitting down and having a meal and they're probably excited by what they just done. They're thrilled. There was this probably emotional high about what they just did. Their adrenaline was probably rushing. So they're not just numb. It's like they've taken it to a whole different level. And I would love to camp out here. I'm sure Dr. Carl Benzio would love to camp out here, but we gotta move on because of time. But what I want you to see here is that we live in a world of unrighteousness. We live in a world where a doctor can just perform an abortion and likely the patient has no idea for whatever reasons, from ignorance, just from not knowing what's actually occurring, but the doctor knows. The doctor sees the ultrasound. The doctor sees the sonar. The doctor knows exactly when he takes the limb and rips it off the baby's body. He sees the pieces of the baby on the table and and then he takes the gloves off, he puts his suit on, and I guarantee he goes home and eats a meal. Mm. I didn't think we can pull that from verse 25a. How about the recent ad campaign from Balenciaga, luxury fashion brand? You have no clue who they are? Good. But in a holiday campaign with a little girl holding a bear. So it's attractive to other kids that see another little girl holding a bear. And the bear is dressed in SM harnesses, sexual harnesses. And oh yeah, by the way, that same ad campaign, advertising a purse, guess what types of papers they had underneath the purse? Subtly hidden, a court case that ruled against 
public child virtual pornography. Think about the person that wrote that ad campaign and they thought it was a good idea and they probably thought they were being so creative and they probably got done taking the shots and shutting down the set and they went home and had a meal. Unmoved by things that are violent, deviant or perverse, we gotta close. What's the point, Matt? The point is this, in the world that is outfitted by righteousness, you and I need to remember we are robed by Christ's righteousness. Back to these final verses as we close. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. This is a parallel on a picture of exactly what they did with Jesus. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. And in fact, it tells us that they stripped Jesus. And when they put him on the cross, he was naked. And at the base of the cross, they actually bartered, bartered and gambled for his garment, a seamless garment, similar to Joseph garment. And here they are selling, according to prophecy, the very garment. Jesus is naked. And we are the ones that receive the clothing of salvation and the robe of righteousness because Jesus was stripped of his. Christ chose to be robbed so that you and I could be robed. That's Isaiah 61.10. He, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Final thought, the world may be able to strike our reputation, but it can never strip our righteousness, right? The world can call the Christian a bigot, a racist, a sexist, a hater, an intolerant. They can strike your reputation and they will, but they cannot strip you of that robe of righteousness that Christ purchased for you. Time is short. This is where we will end. Joseph is still at the bottom of the pit. God is still sitting upon his throne in complete control. Joseph's dreams have quickly turned to a nightmare as if God doesn't care, yet God is not slumbering. God is not sleeping. In fact, God's word and God's work is always working. The world may do its worst, but God's word cannot be stopped. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it by God's grace. Let's do it. Let's pray. So as we end, Father, and we just sing you do glory for who you are, the great I am. God, allow the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our, my strength and my redeemer. I pray that for these people as well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.